I'm on my knees again God, I'm begging please again I need you Oh God, I need you Walking down this desert road Water for my thirsty soul I need you Oh, I need you Your forgiveness it's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips Like the sound of a symphony to my ears Like holy water on my skin Dead man walking, slave to sin I want to know about being born again I need you Oh God, I need you So take me to the riverside Take me under, baptize I need you Oh God, I need you Your forgiveness Is my sweet Sweet honey on my lips Like the sound of a symphony to my ears Like holy water on my skin Oh Use your grace, God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace, God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. Your forgiveness. It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips Like the sound of a symphony to my ears It's like holy water, your forgiveness Oh, it's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips It's like the sound of a symphony is like holy water on my skin. Oh, it's like holy water on my skin. Yes, yeah, like holy water. Woo! Amen. I hope you've experienced that forgiveness. If not, we want to share that with you this morning. Uh, I'm going to ask you if you would, find the book of Romans. Romans chapter 10 is where I would invite you to go today. Romans 10. Since the new year started, we've, we've kind of been sharing with you about the church, church life. Uh, we began about how it's a brand new year, a new start. We all get to start brand new, and that's a wonderful thing. Uh, we've talked to you about the, the majesty of Christ and the mystery that, that we get to reveal and tell everyone about that. Well, this morning I want us to think more personally today, though. If you're a part of the church, if you're a member of the church, that means you've been saved. You've been born again. I want us to investigate this morning and make sure that that's where we're all at. 
that we're, we know for sure that we have genuine saving faith. And so we're going to consider uh, the saving faith that God allows us to have in, in Himself. I'm in Romans chapter 10. Uh, we're going to cover quite a few verses, but I just want to begin reading in verse 14. I don't think we need to read way too much. So uh, Romans 10, 14, and if you found your place in God's Word, I would invite you to stand. And we stand out of reverence and we stand out of respect for the reading of God's Word as part of worship this morning. Romans 10, 14. How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? And verse 17 is really our focus verse. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Let's pray. Father, we bow in your presence, recognizing, realizing that you're an awesome God, that there is none like you. And God, we gather this morning as your children, as your people, uh, because you have made an eternal difference in us. You have changed us, Lord. We are born again. We've been washed by the blood of Jesus. Father, I pray that everyone here, everyone listening through Facebook Lord, or, or the website, whoever, however they may hear this message, that, that this is true of them, that they know you. But, but Father, we know that that's not the case. We know there are some who have a head knowledge, perhaps, but they do not know Christ himself. So, Lord, I pray today that you would bless your word. I pray, Father, that you would convict hearts of sin and and open eyes that they may truly understand uh, what it means to be born again today. And God, we ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, you may be seated. Well, Rhonda and I have been, been throwing around the idea that in a, in a couple of years, uh, we would like to take kind of a road trip. Uh, we went to Montana with Stephen and a group of others a couple of summers ago on a mission trip absolutely beautiful out there and and I would like to go back so we'd like to go out and and you know see the sights and see all that one of the things that I think I would like to go see if we get to do that is Old Faithful now how many knows what Old Faithful is everybody knows what Old Faithful is Old Faithful is a geyser there in Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming uh, it was named let me see I've hooked this up in 1870 it was named uh, as the first geyser of the park uh, and it's Old Faithful and it, it has that name for a reason. It's dependable. It, it says, according to what I looked up, uh, you can count on, on this geyser to, to uh, happen uh, every 44 minutes to two hours. Somewhere between a two hour period there it, it's going to blow. It's like a well is going to blow and it's called Old Faithful. You know we put our faith in a lot of things. Uh, our faith, our trust in something. We, we put our our faith in our cars, that when I get up in the morning and go out there and crank it, that it's going to crank and get me to where I need to go. We put faith uh, in our television sets, that when I want to watch the ball game Saturday, that when I turn that thing on, it's going to come on. I mean, I, I put a, a lot of faith in things, in different things. But here's what I want you to know, though. Uh, the, the strength of my faith, faith the, uh, how strong it is, depends on the object that I'm putting my faith in. For example, people. I have a doctor. You have a doctor. Well, if I go to that doctor two or three times in a row and I continue to be sick and he never diagnoses me right, I start losing faith in his ability. I, my faith is in the object, you know. My car, as long as my car works every time I go get in it, I have a lot of faith in it. But after it's 15 or 20 years old and, and it only cranks every other time I go out there, I lose faith in that object. As children of God, our faith is in something that is absolutely immovable, absolutely uncompromising, absolutely perfect and genuine. Our faith is in the Word of God, the living Word of God, and the written Word of God. Jesus Himself. Our faith is in Him. And, and that is something that is absolutely solid, 
I don't waver. He never wavers. He's always dependable, always trustworthy. My faith is found in this book and the person it's written about. Those two, the living Word of God. Now then, if your faith is simply in the teachings of this book, then you do not have genuine faith. Let me explain. Your faith has to be in Him, in the person this book writes about. You have to know Him in a personal way, a relationship with Him. And I, I'm going to explain that. I want to share that with you. But if, if your faith is simply in a set of doctrines that you have been taught since you were a child, then you have a whole lot of head knowledge, but you do not know personally this living Christ that I put my trust in. Faith is all about the person, this, this object of, of my focus. And Jesus, Jesus is the object of our focus. He is the object of where my faith goes. How do I get there, though? How do I get to this genuine faith? Not just in, in the teachings. You know, I, I mean, I, I've been taught that if I'm, go, if I'm sick, I go to my doctor. Well, if I've got a a, a, a uneducated doctor and he doesn't know what he's doing I'm going to lose faith in, in him but my faith my saving faith is in Jesus he never lets me down he never, he never tarries he never is, he never is, is uh, not available he's always there and he always has the answer so how do I get to this genuine faith saving faith not just head knowledge. Well, I want to show you some steps. I, I see them in here in, in this passage of Romans and, and uh, let's look at them. Consider where you're at. What is your faith in? Is your faith in being a member of the church? I, is your faith grounded in, in just the fact that mom and dad taught me? Or is your faith really in that, that relationship that you have with Jesus? And I want to show you how to come into that relationship this morning. The first thing that I see uh, that, that happens in a person's life on the road to genuine faith is they hear the gospel message. They have to come to this place where they hear the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, the Bible tells me very clearly uh, that the way to Christ, the way to genuine faith is, is the same for everybody. It doesn't matter how rich you are, how poor you are, Red, yellow, black, and white, it doesn't matter. None of that matters. It's the same for every single person. Everyone comes to Christ the same way. You've heard it over and over. The foot of the cross is level. No one is more important than anyone else. And so every one of us who make it into heaven are going to get there the exact same way. And it begins by hearing the good news of Jesus Christ. Well, how does that happen? How does someone hear the gospel? Well, the Bible says that somebody has to come and share it. Look at verse 14. Yeah, we did read this. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? How shall they hear unless somebody tells them? Listen, the very first step that happens in a man's life, a woman's life, that happened in your life, happened in my life, is somebody has to come and tell you the gospel story. You have to hear the message. You have to hear that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Somebody has to tell you that. Somebody has to tell you that, listen, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Christ. Somebody has to come and tell you that. If you're here today and you are a genuine, born-again child of God, somebody took the time to, to share with you this message of Jesus Christ. Now you think about the grace that, that encompassed all of that. I was not looking for Almighty God I was not searching for God. There came a point in my life and point in your life when, when somehow God got my attention and I became curious, if nothing else, about heaven and hell. Well, the Bible says there's none righteous. There's none that seek after God. That in itself was Almighty God moving upon your heart and life and mine. And then as I was curious, as I began searching and wondering, God put somebody in my life that could share with me 
through the preaching of his word, teaching in a Sunday school class. Maybe it was an aunt, an uncle, or mom, or a dad who at home sat down and said, Son, listen, you need to come and, and learn about Jesus. He's your answer. Somewhere upon your life, God put that person in your life. You should forever be thankful that God loved you enough that he has intervened in your life in all these different ways to bring you to a point of salvation. Now listen, somebody has to go and tell a lost world about Jesus. They will never be saved without hearing the gospel. Faith cometh by hearing. Somebody has to go and tell. Somebody has to tell them. That's what God is, has asked of us to do, to be his ambassadors. Somebody told you, would you not commit to being an ambassador today, to telling others they'll never be saved unless somebody tells them. They've got to hear the message. So, so they have to hear. How do they hear? Well, the first thing is somebody has to go and proclaim it. But the next thing that I want you to, to, to think with me about is they, they have to hear that message. Look at verse 17. Faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing. Now, now you sat through sermon after sermon after sermon, week after week after week. You may listen, but do you really hear every week what God has to say? Because you see, I, I'm convinced that we don't. We don't always hear what God is trying to tell us. Jesus said this in Matthew eleven fifteen. 15. He said, He that has ears to hear, let him hear the message. He that hath ears to hear... The Bible is very clear that all have sinned. Have you ever come to the place where you've really heard that? And I mean you heard it to the point where it convicted your heart that that includes me. I've shared with you before. I remember the day when, when I came to that place and understood that it was my sin that put Jesus on the cross. Conviction that it was me. He died for me. I finally heard now, you may, you may sit week after week after week and, and listen and listen and listen, but have you ever come to the place where you have heard the message that whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved? Have you ever come to that place where you have heard? You see, I believe the very first step of, of genuine salvation is you have to hear the message. You have to hear it with your heart. When it, after Ron and I had been married for a few years, probably eight or nine, I guess, I was working at General Electric, and, and they had a management trainee program that you could get into, but you had to have a technical degree. So I went back to school, and uh, I had a bachelor's degree already, but I, it was, it was a, a, a liberal arts type degree. It wasn't science. And so I, I had to take some classes in order to qualify for the trainee program. And so I went back and the closest thing I could do was get a, uh, a major in math. But I mean, I just make a long story short. In order to do that, I had to take a lot of math. Uh, I didn't quite finish. Aaron was born. But, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. Uh, I took four quarters of calculus. Now I was, I was in my 30s, had been out of high school for, for a couple of years. And man, did I struggle. The class that I, taught, that I, that I took I took it on Tuesday nights. The same professor offered the exact same class on Saturday mornings. So you could have signed up for Tuesday or Saturday, whichever one. I would go to the Tuesday lecture, and I would leave thinking, oh my goodness, I didn't get none of that. I didn't hear it. It didn't, it didn't register. I couldn't tell you how many times I went back on Saturday and took the exact same class, the exact same lecture again, just so I would get it. Nicole, I, just, it didn't, I didn't hear it. It wasn't there for me. Too many of us, we sit through church week after week after week and we don't hear what God is telling us. It, it doesn't register. Man, I had to go, I had to sit through it over and over again in order to finally even pass, you know, calculus. Hey, look, turn over to Matthew with me. Let's look at a parable real quick. Matthew 13. Matthew 13. Parable of the soils. You're, you're very familiar with it, but I, I want to point something out to you. Jesus is speaking here, you, as you know. Matthew 13, verse uh, 11. No, no, no. 
verse 18, I'm sorry. Matthew 13, 18. I want to point some things out there. The parable of the souls. You remember the, the sower goes out to see to scatter seed and, and one falls on the, the hard ground, one on stony, uh, and, and finally there's one that that's receives and grows. But I want to point some things out. Look in verse 18. Therefore, hear the parable. When anyone hears, verse 19, the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the wicked one comes and snatches it away. So he says there, there's people sitting there listening to the message, but, but it doesn't take root in their heart. Um, look in verse 21. Well, just above it. He says, this is he who receives seed by the wayside. Verse 20. He who receives the seed on stony places, this is the one who hears the word. Verse 21, though, but it has no root. It, it, it didn't, it, they didn't receive it. And he goes on through. Now look at the very last verse, 23. <clears throat> But he who receives seed on the ground on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it. They hear and they understand. Friend, I'm asking you this morning, as you have heard the word of God, do you understand it? Do you understand that there's not but one way to heaven? There's not but one way to salvation. There are not many roads that lead to heaven. There are not many ways. There's but one way, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only way that a man can be saved. Your good works don't save you. A good family doesn't save you. Being a part of a church doesn't save you. It is a relationship with Jesus Christ. He is the only way. Do you understand that? Are you hearing what God has to say today? Listen, that, that is crucial that you come to the place and you understand what the message is. The message is Jesus is the only way. So after you've, after you've finally heard that, you may not have accepted it yet, but, but you finally have heard this is what God is telling me from this book that I have all my faith in. The next step that I believe has to take place is there comes this step of belief. You have to believe. The Word of God. Uh, verse 11. We did not read these yet. Look up at verse 11. I'll find it. For, I'm going to read verse 10. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. Verse 11. The Scripture says, Whosoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is, over, is, is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls... On the name of the Lord shall be saved. Listen, so you've heard. There came a time in your life when you heard the message. And for the first time, like in me, for the very first time I understood that it was my sin that put Jesus on the cross. It, I, I was in church for two, three years before I understood finally that truth. I'm hard-headed, hard-hearted like all of us are. Well, what am I going to do with that, that hearing? What am I going to do with that now? The Bible says I am to believe. Believe what? What is it that I'm supposed to believe? I'm supposed to believe this word right here. That there is but one way to heaven. And it's not just a mental ascent. It's not just agreeing that that's what this book says. I've come to understand that unless Jesus Christ is Lord of my life, unless I have a personal relationship with Him, I will not go to heaven. I will die separated from God eternally. I've come to this place where I accept this truth. I'm putting my faith in the written and the living Word of God. And that's what it says. I'm coming to this place where I believe what God's Word says. Listen, God's Word says that, that it's the same for everyone. Verse 13, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord. There's not going to be other alternative ways. There's but one way, and it's Jesus. And I have to come to the place where I accept that and I believe that. I must come to this place where I'm willing to call on the name of the Lord. I'm willing to cry out to Jesus in saying, Lord, I believe. For whosoever, he says in verse 13, calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
I have come to this place where I truly believe that this is the facts. That this is the only way. I, I'm, I'm putting all my eggs into one basket. I don't think there's any other opportunity. There's no other way. Jesus is the way. Now I've heard that. And I'm coming into my heart to the place where all of a sudden I'm starting to think, you know what, this must be the way. I'm beginning to, to get this, this mental acceptance, if you would, that Jesus is the only way. You see, my faith is being turned and, and brought to the place where my faith is in the person of Jesus Christ. It's not in all these teachings. It, it, it's, it's not in the fact that Grandma and Grandpa were Christians. I've come to the place where I believe Jesus Christ literally lived on this earth. God himself walked on this earth. He lived a sinless life so that he could be the sacrifice for my sins. I believe that with all of my heart. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. It's not just some story I've heard all these years. I believe it as fact, as truth. I believe that had Jesus not died on the cross, I would not make it to heaven. There would be no other way. I accept that as God's truth. So I've heard this message. I've come to this place where I absolutely know that there must be but one way. But you know what? There's a lot of things that we know that we still don't act on. I know that if I just pigging out, overeating, overeating, overeating. It's not good for my health. If I sat there and I ate four pieces of that wonderful red velvet cake, that's not good for me. I know that, but guess what? We do it anyways, don't we? There's a lot of things that I know to be factual. I know it in my heart, but I do it anyways. There are people out there who have heard the message and they literally believe there is a heaven and there is a hell and they've come to the to the belief because mom and dad do I guess that Jesus is the only way but listen there's no conviction yet they've not been convicted if I come to the place where I'm convicted that if I keep eating that red velvet cake I'm going to go into a diet coma and die if I'm a diabetic I'll stop eating it I will stop doing that if I come under conviction friend have you ever come under conviction to the point to the point where you realize man this is true all are sinners God does love us Jesus died for us I must, I must, must, must receive him. That's the only way. Have you ever come under that conviction? Listen, I'm not asking you to place your, your faith in, in a teaching. I'm not asking you to place your faith in, in the church itself. I'm asking you to put your faith in a person, Jesus. A relationship with Jesus Christ. Are you there? Do you personally know him? You may know about him. You may believe he was real, but have you ever come under conviction by God's Holy Spirit that you must receive him? And that's my third thing, the third point. How does a person come to this place of genuine salvation? They must hear. They must hear the gospel. They must come to the place where they Believe it's truth. The Spirit of God has come to that, that, that point where He has opened your understanding. You remember the parable of the sower. Those who were fruitful were the word, ones who heard and they understood. It took me two or three years to the point where I finally understood that I was lost. Have you ever come to that conviction that you, you desperately need Jesus? Has it ever happened? You're not saved if it hasn't. Now, you may disagree with me on that. But that is my conviction. That if you've never come to the place where you understood you were lost, then you have never been saved. 
I had to get lost. I had to come to understand my need of Jesus personally. Have you ever done that? Have you ever come to that place? So I hear I come to the conviction that I believe the story. I believe the Word of God. Now, here's the part. Here's the commitment. I must receive. I must receive this Word as the gospel truth. I receive it into my life. Verse 17. So faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Notice the progression, what we, we have. We first, we hear. We hear that message. We, 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 we finally hear it, though. I've listened to preaching for years and years and years. I've sat in Sunday school and heard teachers teach for years and years and years. I've listened to, to story after story after story, but I've never heard. But there finally comes a day, there finally comes a point in my life when I hear. The Spirit of God gets my attention and I hear and I move from simply hearing to absolute belief. I must be saved. I must. There, there's no other way. There, there's no other al alternative. I must give my life to Jesus. I must be saved in order to enjoy, enjoy eternal life. So the next thing is I, I receive. I receive the word. Remember what I said? My faith is the, the, the strength of my faith is in the object that I put it in. I put my faith in the Word of God, the living Word of God, Jesus Christ. Remember John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The living Word of God. I'm putting my faith in Jesus. This book tells me about Him. All about it. This is the living Word of God. So here I'm, I'm going to receive the Word of God. What does that mean, to receive the Word of God? Well, the Bible says in verse 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. I'm going to cry out to him. Verse 9 says, I'm going to confess him as Lord of my life. So in order to receive this word of God, to receive the word, Jesus, the word, I've got to do a couple of things. I've got to confess with my mouth that I'm a sinner, that I believe that Jesus died for my sins, but I have to confess him as the Lord of my life. In Bible school, we teach our children the ABCs of how to be saved. Admit you're a sinner. Believe Jesus died for your sins. Confess him as Lord of your life. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean that I'm going to confess him as Lord of my life? Well, look at verse 9. Verse 9, let me read that real quick with you again. I think we've read it, but let's look at it again. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and you believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So you see, with the heart one believes, there's that belief that is, with my heart, my whole being, I accept there's no other way but Jesus. And it's not in, it's not in a, a specific doctrine. It's not in the teachings of the church. It's in a person. It is in Jesus Christ himself. I believe in my heart that he is the only way. Verse 9 again. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Now I want you to notice that right there. The Lord is Jesus. Your version may say Jesus is Lord. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. You see, here's the problem that I have with a lot of people and their salvation. I, I, it's not my problem, it's my worry, my burden, my concern. There's a lot of people who want to be saved, but they've never made Jesus Christ Lord of your life. You, you want fire insurance. You do not want to go to hell. And, and you, you pray a little prayer thinking that that's all that's needed, and I'm okay, I'm good to go until I die. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that I hear the message that I am a sinner, that I am lost, and I am on my way to hell, but Jesus paid the price for me. I believe that's true, and then I come to this point of confessing. I'm going to confess Him as the only way to, to, for my salvation. I'm going to confess Him as Lord of my life. I, have to, I don't believe He can be your Savior if he's not your Lord. 
Now, not everybody agrees with that. I understand that. Personally, I don't see how it's possible. He is already the Savior of the world. He may not be your Savior, but He's already the Savior of the world. He is already Lord. He will one day reign King of kings and Lord of lords. He may not be your Lord yet, but I'll tell you this, you need to make Him Lord of your life first, and then He will be your Savior. He has to be Lord. He has to be your Lord, your, your King, your Master. He is my Lord, and then He becomes my Savior. Listen, He's, he's already the Lord and Savior of the world. The question is, is He your Lord and Savior? We just had a a crazy election. We elected a new president. And through all the controversy and all that's happened, you may not agree with it. You may be tickled to death with it. But as of Wednesday of this past week, Joe Biden is the president of the United States. Now, you may not, he may not, you may say, well, he's not my president. Well, that's okay, but that doesn't change anything. He is still the president of the United States. Jesus Christ is the Lord of all lords. He is also the Savior of those who turn to Him. He may not be yours. He may not be yours, but that doesn't change the fact that He is, and He is the only way that a man can be saved. And so we get to this point where we have to, to, to ask our, ourselves this, this question. Is Jesus Christ my personal Savior? Is He my personal Lord? Do I know Him in a personal way? The object of your faith determines how strong it is, how, how strong my faith is. I put a lot of faith in my car because it, it cranks every time I get in it. It takes me to where I want to go, but... But over time, it starts breaking down, and I lose faith in my car. Listen, couples, when you first got married, you had a lot of faith in one another, perhaps. You, you trusted each other, and you were excited. But over, over time, uh, this person has hurt you, and they've not done the things you thought they would do. And, and little by little, you're losing faith in that person. That's why we end up with so many divorces. The, I, I, my object of my faith is that person, and they're not being who I thought they should be. The object of your saving faith is not the church, it's not your family, it is the person of Jesus Christ. It is the written, it is the Word of God, the written and the living Word of God. That's where my faith is. I am, deter I am de dependent totally on what Jesus did and the fact that He has forgiven me. And I'm in a relationship with Him. And my question is, is that where you're at? Do you have genuine saving faith? Have you ever heard? Have you heard the message? I, I don't mean just sit through the sermons week after week and, and listen. Have you ever come to that place where God tapped your heart? Said, I'm talking to you today. You need to be saved. Have you ever come to that place where you, you believed? With all of your heart, you believe, oh my goodness, I am lost and on my way to hell. But I also believe that God has, by His grace, made another way, and it's Jesus. Amen. I believe He is the only way. And once you came to that conviction, that conviction, what did you do with it? I'm convicted that if I eat too much red velvet cake, I'm going to gain weight. And if I'm a diabetic, I'm going to go into a coma. I'm convicted of that, but I still do it sometimes. I still keep eating. So many of us have come to that place of conviction. But what did you do with it? Did you confess with your mouth, Jesus is the Lord? Did you ask Him to forgive you? Whoever calls on the name of the Lord, what are you calling on Him for? I'm calling on Him to save me. God, I'm lost and I'm a sinner. And Jesus, forgive me. Have you ever done that? That, I believe, is how you 
how you have genuine faith birthed into you. There's, uh, we've had sermons before on faith. You know, there's, there's, there's demonic faith. I mean, there's, there's faith. There, there's head knowledge faith. I mean, there's all kind of different faith. This is genuine saving faith. If you're there and you know for sure you have genuine saving faith, what are you to do with that? In order for somebody else to be saved, they need to hear. They need to hear the message. They need to hear the true message. Not this name it and claim it. Not that God is love and, and, and that's, that's because he's a God of love, everybody makes it. Not that there are many roads to heaven. That's not the message they need to hear. They need to hear the truth that you have personally experienced. That's your testimony. I was, I was in church one day and all of a sudden God began speaking in my heart and He made me realize that, that I was not right with Him. I was not in a relationship with Him. And I struggled with it for a long time, but, but I came to understand that, that a person had to invite Jesus to forgive them their sins, to come into their heart and, 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 and wash away their sins. And, and, in, and I would make a commitment to Him that He would become Lord of my life. I finally came to that point where I understood that. In my own personal life, though, it took me uh, uh, several weeks because I walked the aisle one Sunday and between the pew and the altar, the devil taught me out of telling the preacher what I really need to tell him. And it was weeks later, still under conviction, that I finally called upon the name of the Lord and asked him to save me. That's my story. That's my testimony. Do you have a testimony? Is that your story? That's all people need to hear what God has done for you. And God will take that and use that. So where are you at this morning? Is your faith genuine saving faith? It can be, as of today, give your heart and life to Christ. Call upon the name of the Lord. Crying out to Him as your only hope. And you too can be saved. I'm on